tonight's proposal actually is not really an exposition. It's not me here talking in front on an exposition because the discussion is how to evaluate the practices of a mediumistic meeting, each function, each role, each person within a meeting, evaluating their performance, their development, so that they can constantly improve and have better quality. Because we believe that the development depends on a good evaluation. If I don't have good criteria to evaluate, I could be doing something that's not good, always bad, and thinking that I'm doing something good. So, the criteria of evaluation for our meetings, mediumistic meetings, are very important for us to be able to make them grow. But I imagine that the majority of the people here don't belong to a mediumistic meeting. Is that right? Who belongs to a mediumistic meeting here? Raise your hand. Anyone has a question, a doubt about that? And the other people don't belong to mediumistic meetings, is that correct? So we're going to need, we need to think how we're going to function today, since we have about three hours, that it could serve a purpose for those who belong to a mediumistic meeting as well as for those who don't belong to one. I brought a specific material, I don't know if you had a, had a chance to see it, about the criteria of evaluations. And I also brought some sentences and important remarks for us to uh, guide ourselves about the practice of mediumship because we reincarnate with mediumship, understanding the objectives of mediumship, so that we can then think about how to do a good evaluation of it. Perhaps it's better for me to bring these remarks, and from there, have bigger or greater questions before delving into the specific topics about mediumistic meeting, maybe here we can open up for more reflections. From the book, The Messengers, the second in the series by André Luis, The Life in the Spirit Realm, the first of the series is Astro City or Nosso Lar, the second in the, is The Messengers. There's a moment where he is chatting with Telesforo, who is a spiritual mentor, and they are in a place which is like a school that prepares spirits who are going to reincarnate on the earth as mediums. So from this we understand that to have this ability or sensitivity is something that's previously planned, planned for this reincarnation, so we understand that mediumship is situated in this physical body, planned for this body. But it doesn't mean that in the next reincarnation I'm also going to be a medium or may have the same type of mediumship because we see that mediumship is a trial characteristics that the individual establishes prior to reincarnating. And then he comes with those traits in order to develop, as well as wealth, poverty, beauty or ugliness, intelligence or lack thereof, or abilities. These are all specific trials for the, so that the individual can develop better. And mediumship is just one of those possibilities in order to intensify our process of development, developing morally as well as transforming ourselves and learning in the process. So here, they are in the school of mediums. And the Telesforo has three citations which are very important that call my attention. First, some achieve partial results in the tasks to be developed, but most have failed terribly. What's the majority? Most. Almost all. Have more than half have failed terribly. 
far and few in between. Far and few between. Very few obtain success, some success, in the delicate mysteries of mediumship and indoctrination or doctrine. This was a very impactful sentence. Very rare. Achieve some success. Perhaps because the majority comes here, is not able to handle its propositions. A lot of things, people get lost along the way. Some don't really get lost, but are not really able to extract much benefit. Those that do are very far in between. The Spirit Guide says that in New York there were two very different groups. That's a joke, guys. <laughs> This is like from 1940s, 1940s, yeah. We weren't even thinking about organizing these groups in New York then. What do you think of this first sentence? I wanted to you to tell me so that I can understand what you're thinking and be able to direct the conversation accordingly. If you don't think anything, it matches with what has been said in somewhere where he says 40 to 60 percent that we complete. 40 to 60 percent of our reincarnatory plan, the completists, as they say, are the ones who complete it 100 percent, and those are very rare. Yes, that is the same logic that we reincarnate with a program, with planning of a specific time frame in order to reincarnate, with commitments and tasks, and very rare are those who complete their reincarnation saying, all right, I took care of all my commitments. <coughs> Sad, right? It's horrible if you think about it. Very rare are those who are able to complete their reincarnation, having fully finished everything they've committed to. Specifically for mediums you're talking about, or for everybody? He mentioned, in the book Missionaries of the Light, in general, all of us. And in this sentence here is specific to mediums. Mediums and counselors, or dialoguers, because this is a school where they're in to prepare mediums as well as those who are going to be talking to the mediums. So either his example or this one, the logic is the same, that very few are able to fulfill the tasks. Why did I bring this sentence? Within this logic of evaluations, in terms of mediumistic groups in Brazil and in the world, we have many of them. There are more mediumistic groups than spiritist centers, because there are centers that have several mediumistic groups. I've been to one that there were 22 mediumistic meetings in the same center. So it's very rare are those who will actually fulfill it. So perhaps there's something wrong in this logic because we are doing the work. But we're not reflecting about how we are doing it. And in this logic, it's not very productive. So I brought the sentence and then Zhuang complimented it's not just in mediumship, but for the most part, how we live our life. Because we reincarnate and forget that we are not here at leisure, on vacation, to have fun, to eat, drink and travel. We are spirits with our, with our past commitments who ask for the reincarnation in order to have the process of intensifying our evolutionary process. But because we forget our past and our lack of moral commitment, we come here and forget what we've done. I remember an example which I think is very interesting a professor from the university in Brazil who he had a, s a salaried sabbatical in order to do his doctorate so like for three or four years the university was paying his salary 
and he was off, so he could do a doctorate outside the country, and the university pays for it as an investment, so that this professor can study, improve, and can return to that university and become a better professor there. Well, four years later, he went back to the university and said, listen, I didn't do what was planned. What do you mean? We paid four years. For, it was programmed for you to leave, do your doctorate, and then four years later, getting all the salary, getting paid every month, you come back and say, I didn't do the doctorate. What do you mean? That's us. We plan, ask for this, help for this, plan this, who's going to be the father, the mother, mediumship, the groups, schools, formation, learns a bunch of things, and arrives in the country of destination, forgets the commitments, and let's have fun. One, one hour a week two hours, specific time that's, you know, ex excess over, maybe we can study, think about this thing of moral transformation, but really, that's not the point, we don't live material life, we don't see it, the objective of material life as our evolution, it's like as if we're just here, casually, living, according to the demands, the needs, and the problems. And unfortunately, the number of people who is able to fulfill their existential objectives is very small. If you ask of you, within your proposal, well, I'm 34 years old, what have I committed so far in that program? Do you think I'm handling it or not? like doing a evaluation, an evaluation halfway, he says, I don't know, because we don't know what we've committed to, or what we've uh, agreed to do, so in this line of thinking, you got to do a lot, because at the very least, I finished the reincarnation, Look, I did much more than was planned. So if the completists are rare, you're even more rare that did more than what you had committed to. That would be a wonderful thing. If you're in doubt, if you're not handling it, well, do more. Because then the probability... But I, we don't know of any case, written case, that they did more than they planned to do before coming over. It's kind of a sad thing, right? We're smiling, we're laughing over it. Because I'm like a bit foolish about it. But really, it's, it's sad, sad to think about. So this school of mediums that he's talking about, is perhaps think spending a few years there, studying, becoming better, getting ready in order to arrive here and take care of this task. And when we get here, we actually don't want any of those tasks. And I keep thinking the disappointment of the spirits who prepared us, who helped us in the, our reincarnation project and planning. Because then once we're here, we don't even remember them. There's a case, if I'm not mistaken, it's in the book Missionaries of the Light. A gentleman named Otavio who spent more than 30 years planning his reincarnation. Can you imagine 30 years planning a reincarnation? More than 30, 35, planning to reincarnate. He got here and in 20 years of age, he already started walking completely differently and his life finished at 45 with syphilis, having a child out of wedlock, getting himself involved with people that was not part of the plan and ending as a suicide because of the sexual disturbances. How do you think a person like that comes back to the spirit realm? I imagine the feeling of a failure, of de being defeated, of so much time invested, so much planning, and then after, when everything ends, well, listen, you didn't even get close to what you were supposed to do. It's very sad. And let us not confuse 
with tasks because nobody came to, to earth to develop tasks. We're talking about a commitment in the sense of moral development. Otherwise, we think we have to be going like crazy, doing, doing, doing. Which the more evolved is the one that reads more books or who sleeps less hours or who takes more responsibility on or writes more books. I can write as many books. I wrote four so I can throw it in people's faces what I think they should do be aggressive in my texts not reflect on anything that I wrote I can write 50 of those there are some authors today in the spiritist movement that write 10 10 books you know, overnight it's not tasks these are not tasks of taking the books I'm not going to take those books back to the spiritual world here, this is the bio please check how many points I scored it doesn't work we're talking about leaving the earth better than when we came are you guys feeling are you looking with a very sad face to me can I do something for you uh, faced with this sadness do you mind if I drink from the bottle I think it was small. I couldn't drink a rat out of the bottle. So things get worse. We need faithful collaborators. He's talking about the recruitment. We need faithful collaborators who don't measure conditions, compensations, and argumentation or discussions but those who are interested in the sublimity of the sacrifice and of the renunciation with the Lord. What do you think of this sentence? You're not going to say anything actually, so I'll just make you talk. What do you think it means, do not measure conditions? No, you're prohibited from speaking. Let them talk. Okay, what is not measure conditions? So you can only add. If they speak, then you can add later. Saying no judgment. In what situation? Give me an example. Okay, then, this, these will be like compensations, I guess, right? I do, but I expect or get a compensation, a return. Get applause, compliments. <laughs> what type of restrictions? I think the sentence has to do with medi mediumship with Jesus you know, without expecting anything as a servant there's not conditions expected you're not going to be the main medium you're going to be in your, it's going to be in your terms in your life in your time or how you want it if you are serving in this moment I don't belong to a mediumistic meeting but I used to in the past so we are faced with personal opinions with pride with criticism sometimes from from the directors of the meeting in order to improve the performance of the meeting the person feels resentful 
those criticisms. So for those who work with mediumship in the spirit's house for a while, has already prepared themselves for those things. I feel that people have lost their sense that the mediumistic meaning is a mediumship with Jesus in the sense that we're not there for the phenomenon uh, yeah we shouldn't really be there for the phenomenon or for the compensations or rewards I think it's very adequate what you just mentioned you can't make demands oh but if it's for me if, if it's if it's for criticizing me then I'm not going to participate if it can't be my way then I'm not going to accept it if it has to be this way then I'm not going we talk as if our presence or our work was like a prize for the group and since the group doesn't do it the way I want it or people don't think the way I think they won't have the honor of taking advantage of my presence of my wonderful presence that I am you and many 98% others hug yourselves embrace yourselves and all gonna die together in the frontiers of insanity from logically speaking check how challenging it is to be in a group where things don't perform the way I would like to be amongst people where we diverge and don't agree in the way of thinking to be in a relationship where people criticize me or question me and even so to be good and to fulfill my commitment this doesn't seem to exist because we're only going to get close to people who agree with us who think like we do that compliment us value us and do what we want in Brazil the mass majority of spirit centers they came about as a result of disagreements you're not going to do it my way? okay, I will leave and I will open my own center and do it my way so I used to hate the fact that there's not a possibility of change in that group and so I left it and did it my way but now it's my way and so other people will come will knock on my door and go against my way then those are going to leave and so they grow and build new centers somebody said well in the end it's good these disagreements because new centers are being born yeah it's great yeah it's wonderful everything that comes as a result of fighting very rare are those centers that develop themselves because we've welcomed people the group is working so well that we have so many people that have decided to feature some people to start a new group and we're going to support them in their new effort and form a larger family evermore that perhaps would be something more appropriate, but always as a result of divergences and disagreements. And so we remember the very sp stressful moments of those divergences until the group breaks apart and another group has to start from scratch. And there's really nothing good about that. As to do, because we establish conditions all because we expect compensation I want acknowledgement I want compliments I want uh, a role I want something special something that will compensate for the fact that I'm here because I am wonderful I'm giving of my presence and please compensate me somehow it's ridiculous right if you think about it or arguments 
because we argue so much. Why is it not my way? Why I criticize this? I think that way, etc. And we can't really grow as a result of getting stuck and chained to these discussions and arguments. But those who are interested in the sublimity of the sacrifice and renunciation, with or without pain, it's not renunciation in the sense of, oh, Jusan is like this, leave her to be, leave her be. That really has nothing to do with renunciation with the Lord. That's just a comfort zone. Because now, you try to run away or escape from reflecting, from counterpoint, from analysis. Oh, leave her be, whatever, leave her alone. Okay, fine. Leave them that way. If that's how they want to do it, we are actually in an, we're in an opposite either in those arguments where it doesn't lead anywhere or in the other extreme a renunciation that's not with the Lord but a renunciation of like I don't want to get stressed over this do you agree with me? are you guys more towards renunciation or to arguments or renunciation with the Lord this is in all aspects of our life aspects of the spirit is center as well as the mediumistic group the general cause of disasters in mediumship along the way to not be able to fulfill the tasks to get obsessed is the absence of the sense of responsibility and the absence of of the duty that was planned to be fulfilled. But before we read this, we could say, oh, I don't know what I rem I don't remember what I've committed to. Just like I don't remember, I don't know. I remember what I had to do. But that was good until this sentence came. Once this sentence is read in the Spirit's movement, then we don't have that excuse anymore. Because now we know that we have a duty to fulfill, that we've prepared ourselves for it, and whoever sits and meditate and reflect for a few days about their commitment in Spiritism will know their commitments, things will touch our conscience, and it is for that reason that we don't really start to think, because if I sit, meditate, reflect, my conscience will signal me, oh, I should do really more, or I really should apologize, and I really should learn to be a little less rigid, less impositive, less prideful and so conscience will tell us will tell us so we prefer not to even stop and hear to so that we can hear our conscience demanding of us do you agree with me or you think that i'm being insane so so we're going to go go back to that know thyself it's a yeah the necessity of self-discovery the courage to get to know ourselves. And I think we are very rebel, rebellious, and people can't really see. But how, since the majority, the mass, works this way in a rebellious fashion, we think that that's the, the pattern or the standard. And when somebody stands out in the sense of not really taking advantage of the study or dedicating oneself more or to walk in this path of goodness, sometimes we, we kind of like put them down or dampen them. Oh my God, you don't really have to do that much. Jeez, that person said that to you. You're not a saint. We actually stimulate the person. Because if I begin to see people doing more than the average, I'm going to reflect that perhaps I also need to do more. And so we experience an average that's very low thinking that that's the norm it's not, it's not the norm it's common it's common for a spirit to reincarnate and not fulfill its tasks it's common for a medium to reincarnate and not fulfill its work that's common but it really shouldn't be it shouldn't be our pattern or the norm it really shouldn't be part of our nature standard so we begin to anesthetize ourselves or deaden ourselves with entertainment, with distractions, with travel, with shopping, with food, 
was gossiping about people, was reading materials that are not really useful. And so we begin to take charge of so many un uh, useless things and don't really give time or space for our conscience to signal to us what we truly, truly need. You didn't like what I said, did you? Oh, but I need to rest. Okay, rest in a healthy manner. I need to distract myself. Great, distract yourself in a healthy manner or a productive manner. But nothing justifies this waste of time that we live in with information, activities, rela relationships, people who don't really add to us and doesn't really get us anywhere. So these sentences, they should touch us in a sense of what can I do more? How can I reorganize my routine? How can I really organize my time better? where I can place my energy and what am I doing out of my life regardless of mediumship or mediums or not mediums this is just a reflection for everybody so what do you guys think so far? I think with the excuse that we've done that because we were tired. In the end, it's all excuse. Because if we're really tired, I will search something to relax with, a self-massage to relax my body. I would do a meditation. I would do other things to really rest. Because you already know that lying down in front of the TV at the end of the day, you're not really resting. But we live immersed in these habits that have nothing to do with our reincarnatory plan. Sad, isn't it? Você não acha que desde 1940, 1940 from 1948 until 2018, we've had uma melhora, a little bit of an improvement, na perhaps, na perhaps do, do, do as far as how much we've developed, diante de tantas uh, reflexões, out of so many reflections we've had a chance to do, and where are you getting from, Fred? Well, I'm a little bit of an optimist, so I'm reading these sentences, and it makes me want to just reject everything you're reading. Well, how do you know this is not like just a self-defense from your ego so that it doesn't make you reflect on your life? <laughs> Fred says, are you analyzing me? Because <laughs> I read a text, and that touches me deeply. I can look and say, wow, this really touched me deeply. And I'm going to really, really need to think about this. Or I can look at it and say, well, this is not worth anything. This is awful. So, I believe that's not the case. You know why? Because today we spend so much more time with our outside life. Before, I say before, because I'm really young, but, you know, my parents, my grandparents used to tell me that people knew each other more back in the days. They had more time to reflect upon their lives. They had habits of talking about their lives, 
because of that they will reflect on it now we don't have time these days we don't have time with our children because they're in school and they're in this course and also they can't have one time with us because we have long journeys to our jobs and we have many other occupations that in the end are really entertainment at the end of the day the time that we spend on TV on Facebook on WhatsApp the search for information that doesn't grow us doesn't increase our information that's not really needed to make us better people sometimes we have a lot of information but when we sit on a table to talk one talk and then you go oh yeah that's right and then but it's not something that's really important so if I tell you oh it's true there's something I read and if I tell you or not, everything will stay the same. So we have today a lot more resources in order to run away from who we are, escape from ourselves. And sometimes, in about two minutes, I press the button of the elevator, if I'm by myself, I press the elevator button, maybe it takes a minute for the elevator to get there, but I'm already on my cell phone and I'm looking at something. Because two minutes is too much time for me to stop and to be with myself, let alone 20 minutes. We don't listen to music anymore, classical music. People also have to listen to music. The image of the world with a man sitting down enjoying some music. We don't enjoy music, we don't interact with one another. Each Everyone stays in their own insanity talking to each other. So he says to me, oh, I have two children. And what do I say to him? Well, I have two also. Well, I didn't ask if you have two. He tells me he has two children, but I'm not asking how old they are. If they are two boys or two girls, how do they relate to one another? Where are they now? Well, we already start talking about something else on top of what they're saying. And they're going to say, well, I have two children too. And he says, well, well, I have a boy and a girl. And then I say, oh, me too. I have a boy and a girl too. And then there's two, two people left in their own insanity in, in little monologues, but communicating to each other. And then we leave there. Very little is added to who we are and it's not, it's not a real interaction at the end of the day. So we start to empty our lives. We don't look in our inwards to the other, to our commitments, to our relationships. Is that better, Fred, or do you keep uh, rejecting the text? Good. Fred says, oh, it's still rejecting the text. Like, oh, all right. So this is also something to think about. I'm not just picking you up. But it's also something for us to think. I see a lot the text of Joanna Jangelis. And they say, oh, it's too hard to read her books. Well, if you read more of her stories, more of her texts, usually you can take a lot. The hard thing is to digest what she's saying, because she's very straightforward in a lot of things she says. But for you to really digest that as she's talking, and you are egocentric and or depressive, and you look at that and say, yes, look at this, you're egocentric and accept that the way it is, and act like a kid. And that wants to abuse it, and it wants, oh, no, this is too hard to read, I can't read this. Um, but I read other texts and I don't think it's so hard. Some phrases are, some sentences are. But the idea you can grasp, the commitment that we have, sometimes <coughs> we reject text, reject talks, reflection, because they're really going to mess with us. <laughs> I was going to say that. I also think that nowadays, maybe in the last 50 years or so, people have disconnected from nature. They don't have this connection with nature. 
There's no connection with nature at that level. Or their own nature. People disconnected from everything, from themselves, from the other, from nature. And this is why we're so sick. The statistics of depression, anxiety, physical diseases, the absurd. Because everything comes from this disconnection. Can I ask a question? I hear a lot of lectures. And I see that some lecturers, don't say the name, no, 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 don't worry, don't say the name. But some lecturers say, say that people in spiritism need to work however way they are, whatever state they are at that time. And with time they will, with time they will develop their moral their growth. But others say specifically, especially in leadership, you need to already be more prepared. So my question is this. There are groups that really choose, pick and choose who can or can't be in the meetups and meetings. Now the groups will just simply place someone even if they're not quite so balanced or so prepared. So my question is, what's your point of view in this context? Given that some think it's positive for someone to go however state you're in at that moment, you can already start working and this is going to help you with your, your self-improvement and others think, you know, others that think, oh no, I'm not going to be able to handle it because I have a lot going on, I'm not good enough, I have all these problems. So they don't even try, they get discouraged by this. So what's your view of this? Okay. I understand these restrictions due to the resentment, the fear that some people have. Well, how is that person going to fit into this group? Because the music group has to be a group with a lot of affinity, with the good, good ties, with a common idea, because it is a challenging work. Group, having to deal with all the functions of the mediumship meeting is very challenging. So we are fearful of who is going to enter this group in the sense that it's a person that is going to increase to the functioning of the group. So I think this creates that many groups have these restrictions, not evaluating so much if this person has a condition or not. But since we know each other very little, we become fearful. And I've seen many groups that after the person enters a group, well, you're not going to tell them, well, now you leave. So then it creates this situation that's troublesome. So we learn to be very demanding of the girls before they enter the group. Because after they're in, it's much harder to adapt or to have ties with this person in the group. And sometimes it's not they're not able to fit in. So we've created an idea that I believe is wrong that mediumistic development and mediumistic education is inside the mediumistic group. It doesn't make sense. In truth, the person needs to develop the mediumship, educate the mediumship in their day-to-day -day lives. And when they're in the group, they're already in a task which will help them also develop their mediumship. But that is done in their daily lives. When I enter a new atmosphere and this affects my emotions, I feel like chest tightening. Or I speak to someone and if I talk to them I don't feel well. This is a mediumistic phenomenon. And I need to learn how to work, live with that in the day-to-day -day life. Some people are very excited when they enter in their room and they start feeling sad. And they don't realize that they're being influenced by, a spirit, by spirits. There are other mediums that are lost, and so they enter a place, and then they talk around, and they talk to everybody, and they're all excited, and they also don't realize it's because of, there's this unbalanced exchange of energies with the spirits in this room. This is mediumistic education, the discipline of the reading, of the meditations, and the prayers before going to sleep, so that one can detach from the body, you just don't go anywhere. 
can find any, any company that's out there. But waking up in the morning with a good visualization, planning my day ahead, so that I am not lost from my objectives, developing my intuition in everyday life. Because then I can go and call John and John's like, oh, you know, I'm worried. I was thinking of you, I want to talk to you. And they would capture that. And I'm more attentive to these interferences that, and attentive to my relationships. And I'm more certain something I'm going to see in a few minutes. And buy her flower after a year, she's going to tell me that on that day, when she got that flower from me, she was so sad. And that for a second, she thought about killing herself because she was important for me. And I gave her that flower. For her, she felt so happy. This is mediumistic education and training. The study of mediumship itself, I have a strong criticism of, and I tell you guys, I have a strong criticism towards mediumistic education. I don't know if I was allowed to say this, but I'm going to say it. I have this criticism, which is very serious, which is we only study mediumship in the spiritist home, but what, we, what I call the technical medium, mediumship. We don't study mediumship in everyday lives. What do I do when I wake up and I can't move my body and I feel I can't move and I scream and nobody can hear me? I'm in a state of being out of body experience and what do I do? You don't really know. If you tell Jasana, she's going to say one thing. Tell Mama, she's going to say something else. Sergio's going to say Each person says something different. What, what do I do when I'm talking to a person? All of a sudden, I see something of them that they haven't told me, but that I'm seeing it. And it looks like they did. What's going on? Well, this is a mediumistic phenomenon. This happens when you're speaking to someone. Sometimes I talk loudly, and the person didn't even talk, and they say, Wow, Mom, this is exactly what I needed to hear. When we're talking about mediumship in day to day life, and we are not studying mediumship in everyday lives. We are studying mediumship to speak about psychography, psychophony, the counselor speaking to the spirits. But this is technical mediumship. All of us, according to me, to Kardec, we are all mediums. We all interact in one level or another, more or less conscious, aware of it with the spirits. And all of us, in many moments, are driven by spirits, as they tell Allah Kardec. So we need to study these relationships in day-to-day -day lives, and we don't. This is mediumistic education. In my understanding, the majority of us need to study mediumship in day-to-day -day lives. And some of the few of those people that have been able to educate their mediumship and live the mediumship more extensively, they are then going to be entered into the technical study of mediumship in order to enter a mediumship group. And many people come with symptoms of mediumship in Brazil. We see this in a lot of spiritist homes that have their doubts and questions about mediumship. We say, well, mediumship is in the second or sometimes a third year. So the person kills themselves by the time the third year comes. Or they go to a psychiatric hospital by the third year. Because we can't study mediumship in our day-to-day -day lives. When I worked in a psychiatric hospital, I saw a lot of people that were there because they didn't learn how to deal with mediumship in a day to day lives. They heard voices, they felt presences, they, they saw, they saw spirits, and they didn't know how to deal with this. And they started getting confused in the middle of this and start being criticized in society is insane. A huge number of people in psychiatric hospitals don't have bipolar, are not bipolar or schizophrenic. They're mediums, but they have not found an institution that was able to assist them with educate their mediums. Not necessarily to work in a music school because in the mediumistic work, this ability that I have as a funnel of interaction with the spirits, with the spiritual plane, when, we are, when I'm in a mediumistic practice, this funnel opens up even more. So if I'm not able to 
have a balanced life without the conflict, without being in the middle of the group. The chances that I'm going to have to have a regular balanced life, being in a group, being in the middle of the practice is going to be even smaller. Because it's like I'm inside a car and I don't really know how to drive. And then I take a car that's even more, even better. And the chances of accidents going to be even bigger. But unfortunately, not a lot of people do get that. It's only when you go to the group, when you say, group, do they start talking about mediation, start talking about mental discipline, start talking about preparing spiritually, taking care of energies. So it got better, not because they were going to the mediation group, they got better because they studied and were able to reflect on the mediumistic studies. These are the systems that we should study always. But I know very few spiritual centers, not to say exact, almost always, all of them, in many states in Brazil, I only know two spiritual homes that talk about mediumship in day-to-day -day life. And don't talk about mediumship thinking only about the mediumistic group, but talk about how to educate mediumship. And then there's no need for a lot of people to go to that group. I agree with you, absolutely, because I've had the same conversation, because due to family issues, I had to um, leave the mediumistic meeting. And a lot of people came to me and said, Vanessa, but you're a medium. I said, well, yeah, but mediumship is my life. I feel the presence of spirits. I do studies in my home. I feel the presence of the spirits. I'm a very working mediumship. I don't need to sit in a mediumistic group one, week, one hour a week. So, so this is this is a subject that really needs to be talked about, especially because there's a lot of people, like you said, that wake up in the middle of the night. They, they become fearful to comment in this person's home because they're going to be told that they are being obsessed and they're insane, and so they're not going to be allowed to be, be a part of the group. Pass? Oh, no, they're never going to be allowed to give passes. Oh, I don't want to receive passes from those kind of people. So, yeah, it's really important especially for us. Well, I, I turned spiritist. I became a spiritist here, so I don't have a reference from Brazil. And I see the importance, the crucial importance of talking about this. Because spiritism is for our lives, not so that we're in a group. And if we, who are spiritists, are not going to talk about mediumship in day to day, who will? The priests in the Catholic Church? Some do, some of them are giving passes and meetings, talking about some things a little more open, more different. But the evangelics, that everything is the devil, how are they going to be able to analyze these phenomena? There's no way. We, need, we have this commitment to bring mediumship, which is a basic of Kardec, of the news of spiritism and bring it to the everyday life. There's no need to create these um, select groups that develop themselves and, and what's best is to be a part of the mediumistic group. And if you're the coordinator of that group, oh man, that's great. You are up there. God, Jesus, and then coordinators of the group. It's right up there with them. It's important that you were talking about this day to day mediumship. Many people look for the spiritist centers. People who are not spiritists and never had any involvement with the spiritism in some way, shape, or form had a phenomena happening to them, mediumistic phenomena. That's, that's how a lot of them end up at the meeting, at the spiritist school. So if we're just going to explain to them in the second or third year, the person's already lost interest or they really think they were insane. And by then they think they're crazy. Or we explain, uh, give them a little bit of the surface and tell them that you can, you'll be fine. And then you're unbalanced, but that's your problem. I have nothing to do with that. We're here to be applauded, to look really pretty in the pictures. Well, well said. Many people who search 
Spurs' center come with these symptoms. Because I have the reference for the search for Spurs' hormone and feeling things, losing conscience. Many people are having this common sense to search for a Spurs' group. Now when they search, well, it's hard to have courage, right? Today I was talking to two colleagues from work that are non spiritists One of them says, my aunt and my mom are mediums. And she's not a spiritist, she's a Catholic. So she's searched for an institution of her place. Did she study something since she has this ability, I asked her. No, none of them. They don't even want to talk about it. How are we doing? What is the format? Repete a pergunta. Dele. We ask him to repeat the question, so we're getting in the way of this interaction. How would this, how would this kind of group take shape? There's no specific shape to it, or format, if you will. But in our spiritual center, we can talk about our practice as a group that works in the same at the same time as a lecture, because we believe some people have a certain need, a big, larger demand. But even though they're in a lecture, that would be efficient to them, that would be benefit to them, but because they are in some unbalances, while they're not able to center themselves, sometimes the lecture is not really going to be beneficial to them. So the time that we have the lecture, which is the day that the most amount of people come to the center, is so the majority of the people come New people come in a day of lectures. We receive everyone one by one. Sounds like it's a huge center. It's not. It's a small center. And we like it this way. And we talk to people individually to know why they're searching for the group and explain to them what we have to offer them. So we say, oh, listen, whoever wants has a fraternal counseling. Well, what's fraternal counseling? But to talk with a spirit, you have to take my clothes off. How's that going to work? So we have no way of knowing. So we talk and we explain to them, this is the first time, first day. And then people that have symptoms of mediumships that are imbalanced, we invite them to the specific group that happens simultaneously while the lecture is happening with specific themes. For example, this woman came in and she said, no, you know, I, I'm a balanced to you could clearly see a doctor, she's completely out of it. And she said, well, the first time, she was, we were like, well, have you prayed? Have you been doing the gospel? She said, yeah. And then I started talking to the guys and said, hey, listen, but how is she going to do a prayer? Oh, Marlon, I don't know. Well, you have to ask her. And then the next week, they went to ask her, how do you pray? She said, oh, I start thinking about uh, Archangel Michael and start asking everyone, asking, 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 ask, 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 ask. And then when I'm done, I feel worse. And so, yeah, this is my prayer. So I haven't really prayed yet. And then she said, she admitted she's no longer praying because she would finish praying she felt worse. So she said, even she felt worse. She started talking about asking and asking and asking. So it's, this is basics for us. What is it like doing prayer? For someone who's out of balance, while no one talks to her what it's like doing a prayer, how to do a prayer, let's do a prayer together so you can see and have those benefits. They're not going to be able to balance themselves. So it's someone who's coming there and they're at risk and Soon they're going to end up at a psychiatric hospital if they don't have this kind of support. So these simple things, these basics. I remember a patient in a psychiatric hospital. She would hear the, the spirits and she would say, get away from me, you evil, you devil. She would scream and I would say, listen, spirits are not like dogs. The dogs come, get away from me, get away from me, the dogs go away. So with the spirits, it's a matter of synchronicity and attunement. You're going to need to calm down and obey the thoughts. You say, well, that's not going to work. I said, so when you start to feel the spirits around you, you come, come after me. And we, we made this pact. So she would look for me and we would breathe together and we would pray. And she would say, oh, they're gone. I say, see, it's not because they left. They're still here. But you're now no longer in a tomb. 
with them. We have to teach people how to do this because until then, they spend their whole lives as crazy, as insane, screaming, get away from me, you devil. Who does this knowledge of the law of atonement? Catholic Church, Evangelicals? Nope. We do. So it's in this sense to help people deal with this function that would be basics. Because soon the spirits are going to say the mediumship is going to be our sixth sense. Just like the, the sight and hearing, mediumship is going to become this. But we need to teach people on how to do that. <coughs> There's a lot of people that work in mediumship, that already work in mediumship means, and they still don't know how to deal with mediumship in the day to day life. They don't know how to feel. They don't know when a spirit, a good spirit, is around them or a spirit that's in need. They can't tell, they can't identify with their own bodies because this is how we learn. We learn to identify in our body. And no one said to me, when you feel this pay attention, is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? What kind of thoughts coming to you? What kind of feelings? So that I can identify. When is my mentor getting near me? When is an obsessor? I need to learn how to deal with these in day to day life. My day to day life. I think the biggest majority, most people, comes to spiritual center should start with this introduction because the rest is, becomes will lack from that, will be missing from that. How do I connect to my mentor? How do I do the prayers? These are the basics of mediumship in the day to day lives. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We could take a break right now if you're okay. Take a 15 minute break.